My name is Penny Washburn. I am the president of the American Association of University Women, AAUW, here in Alameda. First of all, we are going to have our presenters uh, make their presentations, and we will proceed through all five of them. Uh, and then at uh, roughly one o'clock, we will uh, take questions from the audience. Thank you all for attending. Um, we are very happy that um, we have uh, some uh, guests with us today. For example, we have uh, Catherine Brayman and Sherry Sorokin from AUW in Marin. I came all the way down from Marin. And we're very honored that uh, Sherry Sorokin is actually on the national AUW board. She's the secretary of the board. So uh, we're very happy that she's with us today. And Catherine Brayman herself was on the AUW national board. So thank you for coming. We also have in the back uh, Jennifer Williams, who is one of our uh, new members of AUW, who is on the Alameda school board. Um, so welcome to you. And um, I want to say one thing about some people might say, uh, what is it that AUW is doing with topics like immigration? Why should the American Association of University Women be concerned about issues to do with immigration? And I wanted to read you very briefly a statement that came up from uh, our national office uh, in September about uh, the situation with the DACA program and its impact on students. Just so that you can see uh, why immigration and its effect on students and its effect on our general population is an important issue for us to be discussing. And um, she says, the new president says, uh, as this was after um, the recent decision to rescind the DACA program. Um, AUW is proud to be part of a community that fights for civil rights for all Americans, in including immigrants. We stand and will continue to stand with the nearly 800,000 Dreamers and DACA recipients. This action by the recent administration is a firm rejection of one of America's founding principles that with hard work and education, anyone can achieve their own version of the American dream. At AUW, we understand the impact that education exerts on the lives of students and on the nation's overall prosperity and strength. We remain committed to increasing opportunities in education for all women and girls. One quarter of DACA recipients are enrolled in post-secondary education, and another third are at high school level, weighing options to further their education upon graduation. With a rescinding of DACA, that American dream will be shattered, effectively slamming the door to opportunity for these students. Congress now has the opportunity to emerge as a moral leader on this e issue by passing the bipartisan bicameral DREAM Act, which would offer much needed relief and protection for DACA recipients. AUW will continue to stand by immigrant students and strongly defend their right to an education. The future of our nation depends on it. So you can see why this topic of immigration, uh, I'm sure there are DACA students here at the College of Alameda, and there are over 400 DACA students uh, at UC Berkeley. So uh, a very large number in our midst who are affected by this recent legislation. Let me introduce our panelists today who will be joining us. And I'm going to start uh, with uh, some of our panelists who are sitting in the front row who will be in front of you in a few minutes. Um, one of our panelists is running a little late, so we'll introduce her last. <laughs> um, starting um, with uh, uh, Sarah McPherson, who is sitting in the front here, if you'd like to wave your hand so that people know who you are. Sarah McPherson is a staff attorney at the Oakland office of the International Institute of the Bay Area, where she specializes in family immigration and immigration waivers. Prior to working at the Insti International Institute of uh, uh, the Bay Area, Sarah practiced in Boston at the International Institute of Boston and the Political Asylum Immigration Representation Project. Sarah is also the director of several documentary films on immigration, including an award-winning feature Stable Life, which screened on national public television. Um, Wilma Chan will not be with us, unfortunately, today, as she is sick. So we have uh, very happy to have 
Vanessa Cedeno, her legislative aide and policy aide to Supervisor Wilma Chan. She advises her on a wide range of issues, including health care, federal and state legislative committees, and immigration. She has an MA in public policy and UC Berkeley and a BA in international studies from the University of Chicago. And she's known for her flexibility and ability to step in at the drop of a hat. So we're very happy to have her here today. Uh, our third presenter will be Amos White. Our fourth presenter will be Amos White, who is sitting in the front here. Amos is a native of Alameda, a resident of Alameda, rather. She, he is with Alameda People Power Activist. He's an author, a community organizer, and he's with Alam ACLU's People Power Alameda, and he'll talk more about that in his presentation. He recently organized the California with the California Sanctuary Campaign for a statewide sanctuary policy. And he has a background in community organizing, including Senate campaigns of Barbara Boxer and Barbara Lee. He's also the director of several literary and arts nonprofit boards and is an accomplished haiku poet and author. And finally, uh, Veronica Garcia is a policy analyst with the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, sitting in the front here. And she will tell you more about their work, I'm sure. Uh, she has supported a number of projects with uh, the Human Rights Commission, such as Equity Advisory Committee, the Community Safety Initiative, and the Youth Police Community Relations. She is focusing right now on issues of hate, bullying, and education equity through building the leadership and capacity of youth at various schools in the multicultural communities in San Francisco. She believes individuals must most impacted by policy and those in need of services must have a voice in the decision-making process. She's a first-generation college graduate with a degree in Latino and Latina studies from San Francisco State University College of Ethnic Studies. So our, um, our next uh, thing is to welcome uh, President Tim Karras, who will uh, provide an introduction and welcome to this event. I'm Tim Karras, and I'm uh, president of College Alameda. Um, I just want to welcome everyone here today. We are so privileged to be able to collaborate and work with groups like AUW, the Alameda chapter, to bring programs like this to the college and to our communities and to our students. Um, knowledge, information, open discourse are pivotal to a healthy society, and this is the type of information that provides that. We have many students at our campus that are in an environment right now of fear and lack of information. And so this brings light and helps mitigate fear. And we want to do that as much as possible at the college. We're here for everyone. We do have a lot of um, undocumented students, dreamers um, on our campus, and they're part of our fabric. And that's partly what makes our college great, is by having everyone here. Um, so they are all welcome. I'm, we're really privileged to have our panelists here coming to the island coming to our college and engaging with us. Because all about community engagement is partly why we are a community college. We are to reflect our community. And you are our community, our students are our community, and that's why we are doing this. So just um, once again, I really, really do appreciate everyone coming here. Um, this type of topic has personal meaning to me. I'm a child of immigrants. And my parents had a certain immigrant experience, not like some others, but I know what it's like to be the first in the family, having parents who did not speak English, and um, being the first going to college. And so this type of information for especially immigrant communities gives them capital to play forward and be able to navigate our systems which ne don't necessarily facilitate easy, navi easy navigation. Um, sometimes they're actually made for uneasy navigation. Um, so all the information that will be presented here today I know will give people um, much more capital and power to take their everyday lives and empower themselves. So thank you very much again to AAUW. I really appreciate it. This is, um, they shouldered this. This is the second event they've done in Alameda on this topic. And any time um, we want to strengthen our partnership with AAUW and have more events at our college because our college is their college also. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Karras. I think we're going to start with our immigration lawyer, um, Sarah McPherson, uh, to talk about the current status of law and some of the issues to do with the uh, uh, recent changes in law. And this is an opportunity for, think of, for you to think of questions. Let's get started. Uh, 
If um, anyone in the room is not a citizen, the U.S. immigration law will put you in one of three buckets, three categories. You are either a permanent resident, you are either a non-immigrant, um, that is a student, someone, a tourist, or maybe someone who's here on a temporary work visa, or you're undocumented, which means that perhaps you came on a visa and overstayed your authorized period of stay, or you came in the country without an inspection. Now, permanent residents of this group enjoy the most security and the most privileges. They can live and work in the United States uh, permanently. They can sponsor certain family members for green cards. And um, most importantly, after a certain period of time, usually five years, in some cases three, they can apply to become citizens. Um, how does one become a green card holder, a permanent resident? Well, there are four principal pathways to becoming a, a green card holder. And these pathways are the same whether you are applying from a country outside the U.S., whether you are here on a temporary visa and want to change your status, or even whether you are here without authorization. Um, four main pathways. The largest pathway by far is through family petitions. So um, if you are a citizen, for example, you have the right to petition for a green card for your parents if you're more than 21 years old. You can petition for your spouse and your children who are under 21. You can petition for your children who are over 21, whether they are married or unmarried. And you can also petition for your brothers and sisters, although that is um, quite a long game because uh, there's a very long wait uh, to get a green card for brothers and sisters of US citizens. Um, if you are a green card holder, you can petition for your spouse and your children under 21 and your unmarried children over 21. Now, the family system, it's, it's complicated. There are kind of quotas and preferences and certain people have to wait longer than others. Um, but basically, it accounts for about two thirds of the green cards that, that the US gives out every year. And that's about 700,000. And these are ballpark figures. Um, the second largest path to getting a green card is through work. This is generally available to people who um, have college degrees or advanced degrees or who work in a field that is specialized and requires training. Uh, most of these people will need to have a job offer, although people of extraordinary ability can be um, issued a green card without actually having it linked to a particular employment. Um, so about 140,000 uh, Green cards a year are given to uh, employment-related um, petitions. There's the diversity visa lottery. We've heard about this in the last few weeks um, quite a bit. The DV lottery is um, a program that has existed since 1990. It was designed to expand the immigration pool or diversify the immigration pool. And it gives uh, immigrants from countries with low rates of immigration to the US um, a way to enter a lottery, and if they win the lottery and meet certain qualifications, they can get a green card. Um, finally, there are some humanitarian paths to a green card. Uh, these are available to refugees and asylees who fear persecution in their home country. It, they are available to certain victims of serious crimes, victims of trafficking, things like that. Um, over the last 15 or 20 years, um, there have been, you know, more or less about a million green cards a year issued. Um, in a few years, the number has dipped below that. Um, usually, it's just a little bit above, but uh, on the ballpark figure, about a million a year. Um, what's changed under the new administration? Well, um, from an immigration lawyer's perspective, perhaps the biggest change so far has been the ending of the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is a program that was um, implemented by President Obama via executive action. It's not a law. It gave certain, it gave relief to young immigrants who were brought here as children, uh, gave them relief from deportation for two years, and a work authorization card. And um, as you've probably heard, this program was recently ended, and DACA will be uh, expiring for almost everyone between March of 2018 and March of 2020. So that's a, a pretty big change. Um, um, 
Trump has also expanded his enforcement priorities in a way that um, really makes all undocumented immigrants uh, priorities for enforcement and many legal immigrants as well, um, particularly those who come into any contact with the criminal justice system. Um, and Trump has, as I think we know, he's um, tried to ban travel from certain countries, uh, increase detention of immigrants in um, removal proceedings, and to expand uh, expedited removal away from the border areas, though he has not done that yet. Um, I like this chart just because it shows how, um, how much Californians have benefited from the DACA program. We have about 225,000 DACA recipients in the state, and we really stand to lose a lot when this program ends, and um, we should all be aware of that. Um, challenges that we're facing. Well, um, DACA was a big tool in the immigration lawyer's toolbox, and now that tool has been taken away. Trump has also ended temporary protected status for people from Sudan and uh, Nicaragua. That's another tool that's been taken away, so it makes it harder for us to give remedies to our clients. Um, there's a lack of clarity and predictability that has really challenged us. Our job as immigration lawyers is to give clear and accurate information to our clients so that they can make important decisions about their lives and future, and when you have um, flip-flopping policies, um, poorly written um, policies, it makes it really hard to give clients the clarity that they need because they need to plan. Um, but, you know, another ongoing challenge really predates the Trump administration, and this is that there hasn't been uh, immigration reform in more than 20 years. So we have, uh, in California, 2.5 to 3 million undocumented immigrants, someone may correct me on that, but uh, 11 million people across the country without documents, and these are people who've lived here um, for decades in many cases. They have U.S. citizen and green card holding family members, they're parts of their communities, and we have um, often no relief to give them. So that's um, a big challenge, and again, one that as citizens we should all be aware of. Thank you very much. Uh, that gives us a quick update on where we stand in relation to policy. I'm sure many of you will have follow-up questions. Um, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, who is Dr. Laura Fantoni. And uh, she is an Italian activist and interdisciplinary scholar in uh, political science, sociology, gender and women's studies, and post-colonial studies. And she teaches immigration history at St. Mary's College of California. And she teaches in the gender and women's studies department at UC Berkeley and at Santa Clara University. She has a PhD from the City University of New York and a forthcoming book on Asian Americans in California titled Local Invisibilities. Her research and her activism revolve around human rights, immigration, refugees, urban poverty, gender equality, technology, and art. And she recently edited a book on Islamophobia and homophobia in transnational perspectives with Paolo Shutter. And she has been a visiting professor in China and uh, in uh, Gula Globalization and Diversity Summer School in Göttingen, Germany. So I'm going to pass this over to you, Laura. Thank you so much. I am uh, I'm a little late and I apologize. I lost my students from St. Mary's. We're, we were car carpooling here and somehow we got lost. So I'm here. I hope they will show up. But um, thank you for um, giving me some time, me and Penny and all the organizers. So I'm going to go back from where we start with Sarah and go back in history and give a sense of uh, immigration laws and policies from the very beginning of the country. So r roughly speaking, we divide it into three periods. The first wave of migration, mostly from Europe, biggest number ever, bigger than now by the way, and uh, percentage to the total population-wise. The retrenchment period, 30s, 60s, immigration goes down, 1960s today, a third wave going up. So <laughs> in terms of millions of people, it is true, the numbers are going up. In terms of percentage of the population, we're always pretty much below 15%, 15%. And the prediction is up until the 2000, uh, the next few decades, pretty much to stay there. 
what changed over time the countries of origins, right? The continents and regions of origins in the world. So we have now a majority Latino Asian uh, migration. That's the case for the California population for sure, but nationwide. And uh, the first waves being more Northern uh, Western Europe and, um, and Eastern U and Southern Europe later on. Some of the, your family members may have that background. So today we have China, India, and Mexico being the three top countries where people come from in terms of sheer numbers. Um, California is also pretty much reflective of that too. Re um, speculations and uh, sort of hypotheses of how the population will grow according to um, uh, projection to 2060. At most, we will reach 20% of the total population, at most. We are more thinking 19% by 2060. So yes, some uh, ups and downs over the last 150 years. Now I'm gonna go to the heavily kind of textual part of my presentation. Apologize, don't try to read everything. See if you have the notes, you have the notes. I'm just gonna quickly run you through that. But essentially what changes over time, 1790 only a free white person could apply after two years of residency. Then slowly the numbers of years go up, five. And essentially they were designed, all these rules were designed for Europeans um, arriving mainly in the East Coast. Um, there was always that tension in the 19th and 20th century about the needs in each area to populate and the need for workers versus the kind of more centralized need to um, demographically control the population. But the foreign recruiting of labor in Asia is very old. It's a very old pattern to which no law corresponds, really. No opportunity for the Asian immigrants was there for them to have legal status, essentially until the 1960s. So we see a long period of time in which Asians are here, but they're not given the opportunity to um, be regular immigrants. Chinese Exclusion Act, a great invention promoted by the Californians all the way to Washington DC, successfully barred uh, the first time, barred the people from one nationality from uh, having legal status in the US. Um, 1890s Ellis Island opens the immigration station in New York City. Many people of your families may come, have come through there. The two decades later, 1910, Angel Island opens here in the Bay Area, processing mostly Chinese and Japanese immigrants. 1907, the head tax is established. So people have to pay and they have to be given an English proficiency test which was not there before. What, does, what was the goal of that? The Dillingham Commission essentially is trying to bar Southern European immigrants whose, uh, whose languages are very different from English and uh, they're considered not non-Protestant, so potentially unassimilable others. Um, 1920s, the Quota Act essentially tried to maintain the same proportion of the population based on a 1910 census. So whichever ethnic and nationality was represented in the 1910 census can then um, receive immigrants by percentage. So trying to maintain a specific um, kind of Northern European 1819 census groups. 1922, all the World War II, the World Wars of the 21st century, the 20th century uh, come in and the question of Japan as the war enemy rises, but um, only then in 19, then we have uh, this uh, moment in which immigration goes down anyway because of wars. 1940s, there is a need for laborers, there nobody's coming from Europe, so China and Mexico become the two major places where uh, programs for workers in port are established. Um, then we get, at the end of World War II, big change, the category of the refugee is established as a separate category that is not from the immigrant visa category. About 200,000 at the Geneva Agreement, the US 
uh, pretty much established with 200,000 a year. Today we're well below that. We're at most 200,000, probably this fiscal year more like 60,000. Um, the first time in 1950s also the Immigration Nationality Act bars the, the, the two categories of race and, sit and nationality as um, potential discriminatory um, yeah, categories to grant immigration. And the national origins quotas is, is barred 1965. So we still have some ceilings related to specific areas of the world, but 1965 is really when we start to see the immigration for a from Asia becoming possible. Uh, Asia and uh, Central and Latin America. Uh, so then we get all the way to the 80s, and you see this was a moment in which um, in which uh, there was a great need for a reform that hasn't happened in a while. The numbers have been going up since the 60s. And so um, under the Reagan years, there is the biggest amnesty of undocumented immigrants. So again, I invite you to think about these laws and the fact that there is no real strong correlation between Democratic and Republican presidents and immigration uh, policies, more restrictive versus more expansive. So this is one of those kind of political discourses that's thrown around, but it's not really, um, doesn't really make a lot of sense if you look at the long historical trajectory of this policy. Today we have, uh, just like Sarah said, um, above 11 million undocumented people. There hasn't been a, a form, any kind of legal amnesty for people since the 90s, really. To, um, to regularize their position. We have something that happened. I came as an immigrant in 2001, right before 9-11 happened. And so I only witnessed what happened after year 2000. And I wanna say most of what we have are restrictive immigration measures. That's all I experienced since I've been in this country. Um, we, you can see the massive rise in deportations. That's again, for true for the Bu Bush administrations and for the Obama administrations as well. Um, we have an increase in workers for uh, visas for professionals, but we also have an increase in deportations. The Patriot Act, the um, Comprehensive Border Informan Enforcement, the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security, the ICE raids. So we see how, I kind of want to conclude with that, um, the fact that the only comprehensive reform and policies that have happened in the last 16 years have had to do with more detention and more deportation of immigrants. There has been nothing of a positive change, if we want to think about it. Um, I, I don't want to repeat what Sarah just said in terms of uh, what are the changes since the Trump administration. Um, essentially different uh, switched over the ban of certain countries. As again, I want to reconnect it with the 9-11 and Islamophobia as a long trending um, measure, as a long trending factor here. But also uh, I want to go back to the fact that between 2002 and now we see a great increase in deportation and detention of immigrants. If we look at the type of crimes, um, most of these people that are detained or removed are not people committing uh, great crimes. And this connects to the question of the sanctuary cities. It is really justifiable to criminalize the population that is in fact just uh, violating um, an administrative uh, order about their immigration status. The last uh, data I want to leave you with is that uh, 2008, 2012, the people detained in ICE facilities are in fact 78% people who have had no criminal records. So um, what happened in 2012, 2014 with the two executive orders by President Obama were essentially just changing the focus from this population, just changing the focus and uh, um, giving the opportunity uh, to do worker workplace raids and really hold responsibility for those 25%, 23% of immigrants who did commit crimes 
versus the previous years. But essentially, this is where we are at, even now. Um, I hope this helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, we will move on, I think, to uh, Vanessa uh, Sedenio, who, uh, as I said in my introduction, has uh, stepped in for uh, Wilma Chan. And we'll talk about, I think, uh, some of the issues to do with um, local policies and uh, the local environment, Alameda County and the state. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, I want to kind of use uh, my position to pivot a little bit now more to the local level. Um, but I want to start by saying immigration fundamentally is a federal policy issue. And I think a lot of what localities, states and localities are struggling with in terms of how they're responding to shifting immigration policies at the federal level is how, um, is how to kind of protect their communities from some of the negative consequences of a system that needs a lot of reform, right? Um, and is integrally um, connected to our economy and our shared prosperity, right? And so here um, in Alameda County in California, you know, I think we have a lot of elected officials who are really proud um, that we have leadership that really kind of recognizes the value um, of every person in our community. Um, and acknowledges their contributions. And that includes all immigrants and refugees, no matter where you're born. Um, and so we wanna um, adopt policies um, that kind of respect, that have compassion for and respect the human dignity of everyone. Um, and that's where we're coming from at the county level, but I think you see it more and more in the way that California has responded so immediately and forcefully to some of the announcements coming from um, the Trump administration. Um, so, and to put this in context, California has been a, a long-term immigrant gateway state for decades now. We have a very diverse community. Um, the majority of our immigrants and refugees are long-term residents. So three out of five of our residents have lived, foreign-born residents have lived here for more than 17 years. Um, they're not newcomers, they're not new people. They're established communities. Um, we see it everywhere we go. That's what we love about, you know, going to the Fruitvale or going into Chinatown. Um, it's just part of our kind of um, environment, right? And we enjoy the benefits of that as well. Um, over half of our children have at least one foreign-born parent. Okay, so that's over half. Um, and so I think a lot of the policies that um, isolate or create fear or separate families are very problematic at a local level um, because we are trying to ensure that our kids are healthy, they're going to school, they're getting their vaccinations. Um, if someone is experiencing a crime, they're not afraid to call the cops. Um, and those things really kind of become tied to a, a national dialogue that is separate from what we're trying to do locally. Um, and so, you know, in terms of framing the conversation for the next two presenters around Sanctuary. Sanctuary has no legal definition, which is why it's also hard to advocate for like a sanctuary policy. Um, it's, it's not defined in any federal law anywhere. It's more about policies that kind of limit the cooperation of local and state agencies with federal immigration enforcement, right? They're just trying to kind of draw a line between what is federal immigration enforcement and what is providing education and health care and public safety. Um, and so counties or cities or agencies or organizations that adopt policies or practices that kind of try to draw that line or limit that type of cooperation um, are considered sanctuary or um, churches that do that are considered sanctuary and they're the founders of the sanctuary movement in the 1980s. Um, the biggest one um, that you may have all heard of this year was um, the California Values Act or the Sanctuary State um, legislation, SB 54, that was championed as a way to, um, again, limit cooperation between local, local law enforcement agencies and federal law enforcement um, agencies working on immigration. So per particularly Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the Department of Homeland Security, just on civil immigration issues, right? Um, and there was a lot of negotiating back and forth between law enforcement agencies in terms of how much you know, authority they still, or cooperation they still needed to maintain and keep us safe, and also how to balance that with our priorities of, we want people to be able to report our local crimes, 
we want to ensure that people are not afraid to call the cops when something is happening to them. Um, and that is very tricky to do. Um, and our governor <laughs> hashed out a deal and it was signed into law earlier um, just last month. Um, so we were really happy the county endorsed that um, and formally supported it. Um, and it does a couple of things. Um, and it also expanded a little bit and updated the, the, I believe it was the Truth Act. Yes, the Truth Act. I always confuse the Trust and the Truth Act and they're different things. Um, but that really was like about ensuring due process, making sure that if um, ICE requested to interview somebody in our county or local jails, um, that the person was notified of that request, told that they, it was a voluntary interview, that they have the opportunity to decline it, that they can notify their lawyers, um, so uh, ways in which we can provide due process and protect civil rights of immigrants as well. Um, so there, those two uh, bills are tied together. Um, it also created a lot of safe zones. So like we don't want federal law enforcement going um, to enforce its policies, um, immigration policies in our clinics or our schools. Like we really want those to be considered safe spaces where people can feel free to, you know, engage in their lives without being terrified that they might get deported or something like that. Um, and then finally, I'll just end a little bit on the local level. I know I have like a minute. Um, so uh, um, I want to acknowledge a lot of the hard work of a grassroots organizations. Amos is going to talk a lot about what's going on locally. Um, immigrant groups are really mobilized right now. Um, and we've been meeting with them um, on an ongoing basis. Um, and so we've adopted over the last two years, um, resolutions that um, ensure due process for immigrants and refugees, that declare us a welcoming county. Um, we've lobbied at the federal level to oppose any expansion of the public charge definition. We are tracking tax reform to ensure that our immigrant families still have access to EITC and our child tax credits, because those are US born kids. Again, one over one half of them have a foreign born parent and they would be affected. Um, and we want them to have access to higher education in schools. Um, and we're working with our clinics to just provide um, naturalization clinics as a form of prevention, get them civically engaged. Um, as you saw, the large number are legal permanent residents and um, they've been here for a long time and we want them to, to feel like they belong um, and that they can engage actively in our communities um, and civically as well. Um, and so I can talk more about what the county's doing, but I'll wrap it up and let Amos come up, is that correct? Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, that's a perfect segue to pass it on to Amos White, who has been involved with the Alameda People Power and uh, is gonna talk more about their activities. Thank you, Amos. And thank you all for coming. My name's Amos White. I'm, um, as we're called, host, our lead organizer here in the city of Alameda for a group called People Power. People Power is a uh, citizens, organizing group that sprung up after the January executive order um, on immigrants. Um, on March 11th um, of this year, 2017, the ACLU um, called for an emergency town hall nationwide. Um, we were in crisis and they had just, for the first time, successfully blocked the executive order of the President of the United States um, at that time. In calling for that um, town hall on uh, their emergency town hall on immigration, they laid out the case for what was going on in the country, how it was directly linked and tied to the Constitution, what were our rights, who are these people, um, what is or what are the faces of America and Americans that will be directly impacted and are being impacted by this um, executive order. Um, that town hall was live streamed online and anyone could see it around the nation. It was held in Miami, however, it was live streamed. There were over 2,200 house parties or groups that got together and streamed that just to figure out what all was going on. And here in Alameda, there were over three publicly um, broadcast live streams. Ours we held at city council or city council chambers. We had over 85 people there. And to this day, um, and thank you for inviting us to be here, to this day we've remained engaged, if you will, as a community group of over 55 stalwart 
um, I would say, uh, local activists here in the city of Alameda. And in Alameda County, over 1,000. Over 1,000. That's out of 55 groups of people power uh, uh, groups organized across the city. What have we done? Um, I would say here locally, our people power campaign uh, first held the uh, town hall, the first town hall here in the city of Alameda on sanctuary to push the city to become a sanctuary city. Um, we also held, and to bring together, I should say, um, all Alamedians to begin the conversation and discussion on civil rights protections. Um, we also held a meeting with our chief of police um, to understand Alameda's police uh, department of policies. Um, how does uh, pulling over um, persons, how, how are people protected when you, uh, with the policies that they currently have in place? Um, what relationships do they have in, in regards to their policies for communicating with ICE um, and or reporting people and or stops and or arrestees to ICE? Um, and those are what we unearthed in, um, in terms of the police departments to policies um, in that town hall with the chief. We also held the uh, town hall on immigration with Alameda County Sheriff um, Gregory Ahern on June 30th. This was the first out of his entire tenure as, as, as uh, sheriff here in the county, first time he's ever held a town hall in over 13 years. First time in holding a town hall with, there it is, it sounds there, sorry about that, um, holding a town hall with um, the public, with the community, in dialogue. Almost 400 people attended that town hall in immigration in um, Cherryland, in Hayward, um, right in the heart of uh, a very large Latino community there at the um, old adult school at the Hayward, um, I think it's called Hayward, not university, uh, Hayward Adult School, I believe it's called. Um, and now we're organizing um, pretty much here locally, educating um, Alamedans, organizations on how they should and could stay involved in organizing on immigration, in supporting local organizations' efforts, whether it's ASLIP um, here in Alameda um, or other legal rights organizations um, here locally and on campuses, at the schools, or I should say through the schools, um, and in churches. Um, there's a number of uh, uh, congregations and, and actually I believe um, the temple as well have their own social rights groups so that they too are aware of what they could do to support local um, residents and neighbors who may be immigrants. Um, we all know what's been going on. Although attitudes for immigrants have been truthfully improving across the country, um, U.S. hate incidents and hate crimes um, in the past 18 months to two years with this election cycle and the, and the election or, or, or selection of this, this, this president um, have increased over 584%. Um, in hate crimes, and that's just since 2014 to 2016 in that period. Nationwide, it was a 57% increase, um, and in California alone, a 10% increase in reported hate crimes. School bullying, school bullying. Um, there's been a 55% increase in Islamic phobic bullying alone, um, and 25% uh, uh, increase in, Islamis, in, in Islamic students experienced teacher bullying, where teachers are actually exp uh, expressing outwardly forms of bias or, or racism or bullying uh, towards students. Um, our response here locally is supporting the organizations that, that um, minister, that support, um, and, and, and teach um, um, and work with immigrants in our communities and across our communities. Um, we believe that um, only through the increase of education um, and talks like this um, and holding uh, uh, discussions, uh, uh, civic discussions uh, and with amongst our groups, fraternal clubs and business associations, and keeping pressure on as far as civil disobedience whenever there is an action uh, federally or, or uh, here in the state or locally that does occur. It, it's a matter of standing on our rights not just knowing what our rights are, it's showing up and, and acting on those rights, which we're encouraging people to do, um, to mobilize, um, get organized with us, but then to act and to speak out. Um, we're asking people to write op-eds and to send letters, as you've probably seen 
um, um, dozens of, 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 of letters to the editors and op-ed pieces since this has all begun. Um, we really do believe that um, this issue will only be an issue and stay an issue as long as the citizenry um, does not engage or stay engaged. So um, in wrapping up, I would like to say um, our group, People Power Alameda, uh, and People Power Alameda County, um, invite you and, and other groups just to do that. Plug in, get involved, and to speak out. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amos. And uh, last but not least, uh, Veronica Garcia has come from San Francisco to talk about the San Francisco Commission on Human Rights. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Veronica Garcia. Bear with me as I'm not used to a podium or a mic, um, so I may move around a little bit. Um, so thank you so much to AAUW um, and Char for having me here today. Really excited to be a part of this discussion with a breadth of panelists that are doing really great work. Um, yes, can see I'm not used to this, so. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm really big on the um, kind of responses um, in case you know, there's something that resonates with you. So if there's something I say that you, know, you are like, yes, you know, please feel free to you know, nod or just mm-hmm, mm-hmm, or snap. You know, snaps are always great. Um, so that would be great for me. Um, so again, I'm Veronica Garcia. I'm a policy analyst with the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many folks have heard of the commission in and of itself, but um, there are 11 commissioners that are appointed by the mayor, um, and then we also have staff uh, that are part of two division, the two divisions, the policy division and the social justice. I'm sorry. I'm so excited to be here. I'm like, ah, a little nervous up here. Um, so there's the Policy and Social Justice Division, which I am a part of, um, which kind of in and of itself kind of shares about the work that we do. Um, and then we also have the Discrimination Division that focuses on employment and housing discrimination. Um, and so today, what I wanted to talk to you about were just a couple of the different programs um, and, and things that we're doing at the HRC to address kind of these immigration issues that are happening um, nationally. And so, um, I actually brought some toolkits uh, to reference what I'm talking about today. Um, they're, they're over by the exit um, in case you want to grab one on your way out. We have them in multiple languages, Spanish, English, Arabic, Tagalog, and um, Chinese. So please take some on your way out. Um, and so in response to the president-elect um, this year, unfortunately, um, you know, we wanted to be very intentional about supporting immigrants and also making sure to provide resources for their allies. And so as a result, um, this Respect and Love Toolkit was launched. And so, you know, it has information about, you know, agencies and organizations that people can call in case there's a raid, in case they need help, you know, if they're undocumented and they're concerned that their children, you know, are going to be affected if they're deported. Um, in case they have assets or any kind of monetary kind of related things. Um, you know, really being intentional about the resources that were placed in this toolkit. So please, I encourage you to take one on your way out. Um, part of that Help Against Hate campaign was also creating different events in San Francisco in response to the Patriot Prayer, um, I, I can't remember the title, but the Patriot Rally that was supposed to happen a few months ago. And so what we did was create a number of different spaces in San Francisco where folks could come instead of going to the rally. Um, so again, just wanting to make sure to create safe spaces for people to come, build community. You know, we had one at the Museum of African Diaspora, which was wonderful at the MOAD. So again, being intentional about partnerships and people that were engaging. You know, it was a free event, food, and people had the opportunity to create different messages of love. And so one way that we're trying to combat all of this kind of hate language and speech that is coming from our president-elect, you know, is, is creating different messages of unity and love and solidarity, and also making sure not to get caught up in this notion of oppression Olympics. So, you know, thinking this person has it worse than I do or things like that. And so, you know, again, wanting to be very intentional about messages of unity. Um, another thing that we did is start community conversations. So 
Um, we did not bring them in color today, but you do get them in black and white, um, also on the way out. Um, and so also, you know, wanting to be very intentional about creating spaces where people can come and have courageous conversations about a breadth of different topics. So similar to this, the Human Rights Commission is hosting those conversations on a weekly basis. And so, you know, bringing folks in to talk about immigration, to talk about, you know, racism, to talk about a number of different topics. So in case you're interested, I would, encourage you to attend. We also have Human Rights Day that's happening on December 10th. Danny Glover will be our keynote. Uh, the event is free and open to the public um, and all that information is also on this flyer. Um, lastly, what I wanted to share is, you know, we have also been working with San Francisco Unified School District to build the leadership of young people. So we're, we were at one middle school last year, it's actually a K to eight, um, it's called Rooftop. And so these young people were able to engage around, you know, different topics, including immigration, including racism, you know, to talk about different ways to have courageous conversations with people and kind of address these things. So what we're seeing is that wanting to make sure that young people are having these conversations early on, you know, in middle school, as early as sixth grade, teaching them about, you know, what xenophobia means, what um, patriarchy means, all these different conversations that may or may not happen in the spaces that they occupy. And so um, now we're expanding to a number of different schools in San Francisco and, you know, really wanting to make sure that um, we're investing in youth. And so I will stop there because I am chatty Kathy, but I'll be around in case you have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to invite our panelists now to uh, join us at the uh, table. Okay, I have a question for, um, for Laura, and um, it's to do with, um, thank you, um, immigration history. Um, is it typical that um, when we have waves and increases of, of immigrants from particular regions, that this produces a backlash? and that we see an attempt to restrict legal migration and also openness to refugees. Uh, depending on the historical period, we have, uh, I noted that we have 1922 Japanese barred from citizenship. This was prior to World War II, and I uh, was interested to see why there might be a backlash against uh, uh, Japanese citizens at that time. Yes. Uh, Is it on? Yeah. Hi. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, this, but I also want to say no. <laughs> I mean, the numbers are not the only factor determining the backlash, right? So we have to look at it politically. We have to look at it internationally in terms of policies and priorities. Um, I often point out uh, the fact that um, the, the, the Roosevelt had this great uh, before um, all the anti-Japanese legislation happening, there was a big fear about Germans, Germans coming to the U.S. and never being able to assimilate. And then again, the rise of Germany in Europe was, um, as a potential enemy of the U.S. interests, was, was going up. Obviously today, if we read that statement, we would never think the Germans never assimilated and their language itself was a threat to the possibility of having a homogeneous English-speaking population in the U.S. So we can see how these uh, discourses changes according to political interests. What is striking to me um, in terms of the Japanese and uh, today the Muslim population in the U.S., the numbers were relatively low. So it doesn't really correlate with the large numbers. If we look at Chinese, Indians, Mexicans, some of the discourse may be based on the rise of numbers. But when we talk about Japan, when we talk about the Muslim immigrants, in fact, uh, we have less than two million in the country today. So we cannot really justify the use of political discourse with this um, fear of big numbers, of fear of taking away jobs that is often evoked, just like in the last couple of years, I would say. I hope I answered. Thank you. I have a question I think I would like to address to uh, Sarah. Um, uh, recently, the uh, California state policies have effectively tried to override federal law. Can uh, California similarly override federal immigration laws? Well, 
Well, um, I'm not sure exactly what, what um, current policies not related to immigration that that question refers to, but um, you know the short answer is that that immigration law is a is a federal matter. It's legislated by Congress um, or you know not legislated by Congress as we've seen for the last 20 years. Um, California can um, enact some protections that um, you know work with the existing federal immigration law. They can. Um, instruct police officers what questions they can ask when they, it, during routine traffic stops, for example. And um, I think there's probably going to be some legislation, although maybe other panelists know more about this than I do, about um, when DACA expires, if there's no congressional remedy, um, whether we can, um, whether employers can ask for um, renewed work authorization, what sort of inquiries they can make about DACA status. Um, so the short answer is immigration is a federal matter, but um, where the rubber hits the road, we have room to maneuver uh, in our local policies. Would any of the rest of you like to comment on that question? I think the only thing I would add is, um, I think, uh, maybe at the heart of that question is, are the things that California, the laws that California is enacting now, are they trying to supersede federal law? And the answer is no. In fact, a lot of those laws are passed kind of um, on the premise that different levels of government have different lev uh, powers on certain kinds of issues. And so, um, you know, the federal government can do immigration enforcement state and local authorities and law enforcement agencies are, are not necessarily by the Constitution um, allowed to be deputized to do federal law enforcement's work, right? So it's like a separation of like, what is local law enforcement duties, and those are empowered to the states and to cities, versus what is in the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security, for example. And so a lot of these, this is why it's very complicated, I would say, um, and it's, it's very um, technical and it involves a lot of different opinions from, it's not, it's not entirely laid out yet. It, our courts are going through this discussion right now as judges are kind of weighing in on this, and you'll see that the Supreme Court is very hesitant to take on certain cases because they know that if they make an opinion on, w on some of these questions, it'll have implications for centuries, right? Once the Supreme Court weighs in, it's, it's kind of hard to over th uh, overturn those opinions. Um, and so um, it's all being battled out right now. But it, I don't think anything that California do is doing right now is trying to supersede federal law. In fact, it's relying on those constitutional provisions to protect its own residents and its own agencies from any legal liabilities. Thank <laughs> you.